Hello, everyone. Okay, that was with the bad sound in the background. Hello, everyone, again. Um, I'm happy to see so many people again in this um, open lecture. Um, this time with Rebek Reddy. Um, and we are very proud to have him today here and teach you um, the basics or a few tips and tricks about rendering optimization. And yeah, so um, this is basically part of our open lecture series. And um, I don't know, some of you may already be following us for a while. Um, we're, we're very proud to always have very exciting speakers, actually. Um, there was, for example, one with Julia Schwartz from Hodelands. Um, we had one with Magic Leap, Karen and Savannah. And um, on 9th of December, um, we're also very much looking forward to have an open lecture with Freya Homer. And she's going to, I mean, she's the creator of basically Shader Forge and Shapes. And that's very well known tools um, in the Unity Asset Store. Um, so she's going to talk about that and answer also all your questions about that. So um, yeah, please feel free to, to check our Eventbrite uh, page, the exabootcamp.eventbrite.com page, um, where you can follow us and be notified about all these open lectures. Um, yeah, of course, we also offer deeper um, uh, courses on how to develop um, and how to manage basically virtual reality and augmented reality projects. And um, all our classes are really industry focused and very focused on getting your portfolio projects and learn by doing basically. So um, we have a great advisory boards from all the bigger companies out there which use VR AR and which are, who are looking also to hire VR AR developers. Um, so basically in all our courses, you always get very much connected with this network as well of companies and um, really learn the skills that are very much needed in the industry and that everyone should, should learn. Um, our alumni are usually giving us great feedback on our courses. Um, we're always very happy to hear that. Um, so even like for, for Unity developers who are already like developing for years, um, we are still offering advanced level content. Um, then of course we have on all our mentorship, one-on-one -on -one mentorship, which is very helpful because you can basically um, advance very quickly and you don't need to spend and um, waste so much time on researching solutions or, or asking um, too many other people. Um, and, and yeah, our industry network has also turned out to be very helpful for some of our students, which afterwards got um, yeah, directly some, some project, projects, uh, VIR project commissions. Um, yeah, and um, also like our, um, all our alumni and lots of companies are already sending their employees to, to our courses. So um, also when you are joining, uh, you will see that even the, uh, yeah, the, the other students in our course are very well to, to network with as well. Um, so yeah, now, I mean, this is basically the overview about our next courses, which we are offering. Um, uh, yeah, like with, with Rivek, we will have on December 12th, we will have a, um, a, deep, um, a deep rendering optimization class um, where you can really practically learn everything in detail. And um, I would also like to introduce my co-founder to me, um, co-founder of Excel Bootcamp, Pia Han, and he's going to talk a little bit more about um, the classes in detail. Hey everyone, um, it's very nice to We have always a great interest. We can definitely say um, uh, we are excited here to, to see you and um, we would like to actually um, get the industry interest to rendering optimization. We know that because of standalone devices um, and mobile devices, sometimes the rendering optimization or general games and uh, apps optimization is not uh, happening in the um, desired way. So we are happy to, to, to support on this um, trainings. And as Ryan mentioned, we have several classes. Some of them are uh, for beginners, some of them are for advanced. And uh, we have a great lineup of classes over the next weeks. And of course, beginning of next year, and I will just go through very quickly on what kind of classes we have right now. And the first uh, one, maybe this is something for especially people who are Unity uh, uh, developers and who would like to actually be matched with a subject matter expert to create a portfolio project. This is the best, uh, actually one of the best uh, um, opportunities out there. Uh, we we match you with an enterprise um, 
design or engineer or subject matter expert and we actually want you to create a training scenario in four weeks and then we are giving the, the uh, all the necessary tools and knowledge needed for this program and it will start uh, early next year so our next program is uh, one of our uh, like advanced classes we have already now uh, students and alumni i think following this class uh, this uh, open lecture that it is advanced vr ar interaction design um, we are going through holographic ui towards immersed kinematics physics-based interactions so the main goal is to help you to create lifelike interactions like you see in half-life elixir or any other um, games uh, we want you to push the boundaries i should first warn you that this is an advanced class but uh, if you are committed enough um, you can you can really succeed we have a wide selection of assignments every week from um, easy medium hard hardest so we have actually a video about that to show you uh, the experience itself uh, from mentorship and uh, the, the project itself, which is a ro virtual robotic arm. So our team will uh, open up the video now. So uh, we, can, we can have a, a, a better uh, idea about the program. Hello and welcome to the Viral Deep Dive. So with this class, we will uh, teach you multiple aspects of hand tracking. But it, if it does a double pinch, a little sphere gets created. So we want to detect a double pinch. How to implement the locomotion hand tracking. It's always relative to the center of, the, of your tracking space we'll use to create that curve. Both directly with touching it with your fingers, basically build that you can interact with it and make it fully interactive and responsive. For example, we will start with like the hand UI to use pinching gesture to expand those part dynamically. Dot product and how it works and what kind of value you can use to detect those events. So let's have a closer look at the actual implementation. Uh, we want it to move on the z-axis so we have to define it here when I can grab one so as you can see here. When they lie on the table or fully physics based as soon as you grab them you can even throw it in and it goes directly in. It's all automatic. Even if you hold an object now, you actually can still interact with the world. Different kind of joints, we will uh, go through them, all of them, and see where they can be used. That piece is defective. Put it in the trash can. Boom. Julia is a principal software engineer working on the HoloLens team. Karen Stolzenberg, who is lead interaction designer, and Savannah Nayas, a lead product manager at Magic Leap. Today I'm going to talk about all of the prototyping and the work that really went behind actually shipping instinctual interactions for HoloLens 2. So we're hoping to offer really a unique perspective um, designing gesture interactions in XR today. Um, we approached uh, the design of these hand gestures and the design of these avatar hands with a really specific goal that was to enable embodied communication. Okay, so we've talked about sort of UI controls and uh, pressing things. How about moving things? Explain a little bit about how this experience really is spatial in what feels like a really one-to-one -one way. And we can kind of get to this feeling of virtual social presence through kind of three different elements. Fabric seems to have a hard time. As soon as we remove the restrictions, all of them react quite nicely. Very interesting little creatures. So that you can go to them, grab them, and then dynamically put them back in the trash can. If you have the joystick to control the position of the robotic arm, you have a trigger to activate the pincher. Let's have a look at the hologram control system really uh, like fine control of the robot dynamically. I can move down the robotic arm. Welcome to the graduation ceremony of XR Bootcamp's uh, viral hand tracking program. Cannot be more excited to like have the viral bootcamp. Uh, we really enjoyed it and we were especially happy when we got the feedback from you that you really enjoyed. <laughs> Yes, so uh, I hope that this gave, gave a little bit of uh, insight about what kind of program um, that uh, is waiting for you if you want to get enrolled. As I mentioned, this program will start early next year, mid of January, 
We already have students who are being enrolled, so happy to see you before uh, we, we, we fill the class. Uh, this is a very important class for us because uh, for those who, who want to actually increase the fidelity of interactions. But today, our, and we have a few uh, programs, as you see, in terms of shaders and rendering optimization. Uh, in the next upcoming two weeks, we will uh, help you or support you in terms of how you can actually reach the same fidelity in visual aspect. So today we have uh, Vivek ready, and his workshop will be happening 12th of uh, December um, on Saturday. Um, in approximately two weeks time. And in this workshop, he will go deep into uh, several topics, which is actually based on different scenarios and cases that you can have as a pitfall in your own uh, um, project, Unity, Unreal, game, VR, AR, mobile app. So uh, we would like to support you on that. And in this workshop, we also have um, live q &A. In addition to that, uh, we, we have Drink Your Own Project, which is maybe uh, one minute I can explain this to you. You can literally bring your own uh, rendering related problem or uh, pain point or question or project that Vivek actually will look at the project beforehand and in front of uh, the audience he will actually give feedback to you um, and you will also listen to other, other projects, uh, pit, pitfalls and how it can be solved from uh, our trainer's point of view. So we are very excited for this uh, moment, but before that, we want to show you a glimpse of what you will see on 12th of December. So that's why we created this um, free open lecture for you. And I hope that you will enjoy. So um, for the... Um, before starting, maybe since today is Black Friday, we also uh, would like to um, use the opportunity to make our classes more accessible. So uh, for starting from now, we have uh, all our programs will be 20% uh, off um, till 1st of December. And maybe we can have a few uh, students today joining us for either Vivex um, uh, masterclass or uh, Roger and Dennis um, via interactions and hand tracking class. So without further ado, I would like to leave the stage to Vivek. Vivek, can you hear us? Yep, I can. I can hear you all, uh, Farhan. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going uh, to thank you for for being with us um, and. Um, in the next 30 minutes or maybe 40 minutes, we will have Vivek's presentation. And we will also, if we have time, we will also um, definitely uh, give some time for your questions. Um, and I'd love, I'd love to um, see what kind of questions coming up. Everyone has different optimization problems. I hope that we can at least uh, tap into majority of them today, at least in a high level perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, after that, we can get questions. So the next stage is yours. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the introduction, Fahan. And uh, thank you all for coming over for this talk here today. Uh, I hope all of you are doing well. I mean, amid all the COVID pandemic that's happening and happy Thanksgiving for all of you who are celebrating it. I'm, uh, I'm really excited about this uh, this open lecture for today, as well as the, the course that's have the, the main principles class that's happening on December 12th. So in this class, we thought of uh, going over some of the basic concepts, like uh, 30 minutes or 40 minutes of explaining uh, what is it that's going to be different in this class from a rendering optimization point of view, or what, what is rendering optimization at all kind of uh, topic. So before we enter into all the things that I'm, I'm going to say for the next a uh, few minutes. Uh, uh, the, the whole idea behind this topic is every one of us are creating content. There's a lot of real time content coming out into the market right now. But uh, there is a knowledge gap that's happening also while while the game engines are getting free and a lot of us are the users, creators and uh, technical uh, people, programmers and also artists. There's not uh, what happens is when you're trying to create content, 
uh, it's uh, so most of them are not able to get it to the quality level that you're seeing in the market from AAA companies or other markets. So what the idea behind this thing is uh, the rendering optimization is a concept where we can take a look at how are we how are we approaching problem solving while creating content. And hence, the differentiating factor that we wanted to introduce in this uh, in this series is why not you understand the topic from the hardware perspective as well, and not just the software perspective. So myself, coming from uh, electronics background as well as computer science background, I usually was dabbling uh, deep down into the electronic side of things as well, not just the computer graphics side of things. So, so what uh, what my perspective here is like if you if you Google yourself and search for optimization in Unity or optimization in Unreal, you will get a lot of lot of uh, lot of uh, tips and tricks kind of a thing. But then, but then softwares keep changing, right? So there has to be a way you can think of a problem statement when you see uh, when you see when you, when you're developing the game, which is exactly what is the is the goal of this whole series, which is how can uh, we share more knowledge regarding how actually a rendering process itself is happening so that you can start thinking and have strategy for optimization. So these are the topics that we're going to cover today. There are less topics, so we will be mainly focusing on them though. We will be learning these main important questions, which is what, why, when, how, where, and uh, learning from all these questions. So uh, we'll start with what is rendering optimization and uh, like all these six questions. And let's get started now. So what does rendering optimization means? When we create any content, we have to, uh, if we need to get it to the maximum performance, we have to measure what it's performing at, which we need to analyze and infer from what, what is the measurement. And then we, we, uh, we have, after the analysis, the inference is where we execute things. So we infer what, we, what went wrong or what, is the, what we learned from the analysis and then we execute it. So this is the meaning of rendering optimization. And this is required in any content, be it an automobile industry, gaming industry, movie industry, or anything. Uh, it, is, it is a common thing that happens anytime you create any 3D content uh, in, in today's uh, engine pipelines. So when do we use, when do we use this? We use this when, we, when uh, so sorry, why do we require this? We require, we require rendering optimization if we require higher frame rates, which is one of the critical components which uh, audience will usually recognize uh, thinking that that's one of the important factors where everyone, it's visible result, that's all. And then you can get better looking output. You might be getting stuck at a certain quality of output and you want better quality looking. And by solving these two things, you can add other features as well, which is Hey, you know what? It's it's looking it's looking great, but can I add one more tree? Can I add one more car over there? And can I make it a little more fancy looking? Uh, more features, more particle effects. You know, you can make such decisions. So that's that's why you require rendering optimization. And after you know why you require and when do we use this? So we use this when. We use this when we when we can figure out what is the rendering budget that we have, and uh, we can we can limit it to that rendering budget. Or if we are limited with the rendering budget, I'll talk more about rendering budget and all these things. It's a uh, lot of the words I'll be using can sound complex, but I'll try to decipher them in a very easy to understand manner. I'll not be when of course there won't be any programming in this one as well. And then what? Uh, you use it when you see inconsistency in your performance of your content. If you see drop frames or if you see any simple uh, errors that are coming up, tearing and uh, uh, game getting stuck, loops are not working as you expected, and uh, those are those are that's another situation. And you also use it when you want to match your hardware performance for different uh, different hardware. Like you you develop somewhere for some particular hardware and you want to use it for somewhere else. That's when you use rendering optimization to understand, okay, this is how it was performing here and if it needs to perform there, this is what I need to be done. So we already completed three of our uh, six points, six topics that we wanted to complete. The next three are going to take some time. Uh, so bear with that, but it's going to be very interesting from now on. So these, this is the requirement. I just wanted to emphasize the importance of this whole topic. It usually gets uh, 
that doesn't get so much attention because it gets boring after a while or because it gets if it gets too technical it's also a boring topic sometimes but it's a it's a very critical one from now on so before we understand rendering optimization and understand how to do it in the modern game engines or anything we should understand what is rendering and on a simple terminology uh, if we start looking rendering is nothing but hey you know what i have a bunch of uh, objects like a cube and a cylinder and then they're made up of these triangles that's the basic uh, building block of all these uh, elements and then i have a computer the monitor and i just want to get that image over there so a 3d application where you create these objects they're all formed uh, like there is a lot of process that happens before you get it on the monitor and that's exactly what is called as rendering the whole pipeline of how these triangles go into the whole process of software and hardware and come out as pixels on your monitor is what is rendering. So once you know rendering, rendering pipeline is the concept where you see, you connect the dots. Like there are thousands of dots. If you can think of it as thousands of dots and you need to connect all these dots. How does information flow from the moment you create something all the way to the display? So that's exactly the uh, pipeline. It's called rendering pipeline. And understanding rendering pipeline is how you can solve problems. If you understand only the software part of it, you are bound to get stuck so many times because uh, that's that's the whole point of it. Which is, uh, it's like if you understand only the car and not the engine, you, you, when a car gets stopped, you don't get to know how how to repair the car, right? So that's that's like the analogy and metaphor for this. But uh, Rendering pipeline is basically like learning a little bit of the uh, engine of the car as well while you're driving the car. But uh, but yeah, so but uh, the next version I'm uh, I'm going to be showing uh, a, a little uh, small demo on how the rendering pipeline works. So on a simple use case, let's assume we are making a game, okay? And uh, the game has to look like this. It's not looking like this right now. Imagine it's not looking like this. But it has to look like this. This is our experience that we want to create. So then all of this content would first be there in our hard disk, right? That's that's one of the basics that we all understand. It's there in the hard disk. And then all of these, uh, let's, let's imagine all of this content as 3D objects, textures, and all these uh, elements that make up a game. They're all stored in a hard disk, and then they have to load up into a RAM, right? And then we have this component called a CPU in a, com in a computer. And they both will be communicating. But the next one that you're seeing here is command buffer. So CPU will be talking to something called as command buffer. A command buffer is the middle layer that will be talking to another device called uh, the GPU. So you're familiar with CPUs and GPUs in today's world, but uh, this is basically showing how they're all communicating and talking about them. So, Command buffer is the way in which the CPU will say, hey, you know what? I don't want to talk to GPU directly. I will use a command buffer where I'll store all the instructions that, in, that need to go to the GPU. And they both are, they both can talk interchangeably, like back and forth, uh, in, like I'm showing in the diagram. And even GPU has memory. It's called video RAM, uh, GPU RAM. And it has, has these tiny little memories inside it called L1 cage, L2 cage, and all these other memories. All right. so. Uh, and then, and then uh, when you uh, see here, the CPU, when it talks to GPU, it has a particular way of communicating, and that's called setting something called as render state. It the CPU tells the GPU, hey, you know, I want to set something called as render state, which is the state of all my polygons, all my triangles, and all these things. That's that's how it tries to communicate. We'll not be going deep into what what all those render states are right now, but we'll do it later on the December twelfth version. So, and then it says a draw call. Uh, it, it, it also sends something called as a draw call, which is, hey, you know what? Draw, the, draw this triangle for me. Draw this cube for me. Draw this, draw this, draw this, draw this. These are the instructions that it will give for one frame, OK? And we'll talk about what a frame is later on. But you know, even uh, here in the RAM, if you're seeing in the RAM, if uh, there is there's this texture, it all has to get copied to GPU memory as well. So if you're seeing here, the highlighting point here is, CPU is there, memory is there, and GPU is there. And all of these things are talking with each other. This is called rendering pipeline. 
and and then once we enter the gpu once the data enters the gpu where the cpu will tell hey gpu render me this triangle or something then the gpu will take that information and first step it, it's going to do is called a vertex shader inside a gpu this is this is all happening inside a gpu now and inside a gpu the vertex shader is basically operating on the vertices and then there is a process called culling we don't have to worry uh, more about this right now but but these are all the steps that are happening inside a gpu oh, that's all i want you to remember it's basically a state of things that information is traveling through and then there is a thing called fragment rasterization and fragment shader which is responsible for actually putting your pixels on the screen okay uh, and then finally uh, we are reaching the end where there is a z test uh, where is it it's, look, it's looking for the depth of each pixel and then once the z depth happens the finally the stage is called uh, we have two things called color buffer and z buffer where it's where it's storing all the final pixels so if you think about a tri one triangle going all this journey this is exactly what will happen even if you want to render one triangle or 100000 triangles one triangle will be loaded exactly this way the cpu will tell to the command buffer and the command buffer will talk to the gpu the triangle will go to the vertex shader and it will get modified into uh, screen space and model view matrices and all these things we'll talk later about all of that but just imagine vertices of a triangle getting modified and then culling means it's going to remove the un un unwanted faces and un uh, something that's not visible to the camera and fragment shader it will pull up all the pixels and draw them onto the screen it's going to test am i am i having another triangle in front of me or something else is behind me and that's what is z test and finally it's going to draw it into something called frame buffer or color buffer and then it's going to go to our monitor so this is rendering pipeline i know it might sound too many steps in fact i'm i'm very i'm simplifying this like 10% of the actual thing that's happening 100% there are too many other things happening but we're not talking about this right now but this is what i would like you to understand before we proceed further and inside gpu there are so many other things that are happening uh, which is vertex input assembly tessellation rasterization multi sample depth stencil color these, these are called fixed function states which means inside a gpu a gpu is also a machine right uh, but gpus have uh, programmable parts and non programmable parts and these are like fixed function which is doing a fixed operation parts inside a gpu and it, and then inside a gpu also we have other parts which is vertex shaders fragment shaders this is something that if you are someone who is a game developer already you would have heard about all of these things but but these are uh, uh, these are the things which can be programmable by the user all right now now the gpu that i showed you is just a general gpu it will change for every piece of hardware so if you're developing for vr it has its own gpu coming on board and if you have if uh, if you have different uh, device augmented reality devices mobile devices iphone or galaxy devices everything has its own gpu cpu combinations so you're seeing the complexity of this right like there's so much hardware involved that actually determines how the product works so if you are doing something rendering in any of these devices having an understanding of how different they are actually helps you to uh, to solve a problem is why i wanted to emphasize the fact of rendering pipeline here so and if you see in the market there are many engines right unity unreal and there was renderware all these years cry engine frostbite from ea games the ultimate goal for all of them is they have to do an efficient job in utilizing this pipeline so when they design a game engine their goal is how can we make our game engine faster better and good looking and better performing and when it goes to you guys which i'm considering as developers artists any anything related to who want to go into that so so we we are going to learn about every bit of hardware which is vr hardware and ar hardware later on in the in the class uh, in the in the rendering principles class on december 12th but for for now that's that's like the introduction for rendering and the next thing that i would like to talk about is uh, profiling and profiling is uh, is a fifth topic in our in our set of topics and profiling is all about understanding how how things are working how 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 can you measure things so in in profiling these are the five things that you want to remember cpu gpu memory time battery this is the same thing that i was emphasizing earlier as well but in profiling 
it's a process where you'll see metrics you know you'll see information about how your game was performing and uh, analyzing based on that so you have to have some uh, it's like a speedometer for your car that's what it is it's like it's telling you how much is the rpm how much is the speed you're going what's the tire pressure and everything for your car and that's exactly what it is and a different profiler is in the market unity for example has its own profiler where where it will show you all the diagrams graphs and everything unreal insight intel also has its graphics analyzer render doc adb under debug bridge and arm mobile studio as well uh, arm is a latest one that uh, and arm, arm uh, it has an automatic performance analysis it's like uh, you know auto repair kind of a thing for your cars like uh, that's what that's what i would like to imagine it as but uh, we will not be going into any of these profilers now which it will be done later but uh, this is how profilers look like in general no need to get scared they are very simple things that are just going to go over data uh, like I told you, right? CPU is talking to the memory, and CPU is also sending information to command buffer and then to the GPU. This is basically deciphering all of those instructions. It's like two people are talking, and in between, we are we are analyzing all all the information through these profilers, analyzing, hey, why are you why are you taking so much time to render this thing? Like, you know, tell me some more information, kind of a, kind of a workflow. So that's profilers, and with, in, in, when when understanding a profiler, it, you should understand how a frame is made up of. You know, one frame, one frame of information has so many draw calls that happens. Like it will draw a triangle first, it draw a tree first, and then a car. Like to just draw one frame, there are a bunch of sequences that happens. So which is why, like a CPU will be doing certain part, and then the GPU will be doing certain part. So the so CPU will be like. It, it's it's running this game sector called game loop and then it has a draw it's a draw call means cpu is telling the gpu hey you know what i did all my calculations now gpu take over and draw them now and then the gpu will start that's exactly how a frame is drawn like this is one draw call kind of a thing you can think of it like that so cpu uh, and then you see here the gpu is waiting while the cpu is doing so i want you to observe these details which is hardware is performing by in a certain order of things. It's not magic, like nothing is magic. It's all human created stuff. And it's all happening in a sequence of order. So, and it's 11 milliseconds for this frame. And then the CPU will start again. The CPU will say, I, I don't care, the GPU is running. Like, I'll just I'll just continue. And then and then the game loop is finished in the CPU and then the, the draw call will come. And yeah, yet again, the GPU had to wait. And then the GPU will start again. This is called GPU idling. It's GPU is just waiting, not doing any work. It's just waiting there. It's a waste of time, right? Uh, and then this one took 18 milliseconds. You see, the difference between these two things is like so large, and and these things matter in frame rates. Like when when a CPU takes more time or a GPU takes more time, that's when your frame is suffering from it. Okay, and then and then here you see the CPU is waiting as as well. It's it's because you cannot just continue the CPU to just just go crazy and you know, keep calculating, and the GPU is not doing its work. It's like they're friends and CPU does its job and it tells the GPU to do its job. And the GPU, if it's struggling to do its job, the CPU says, you know what, I'm going to wait for you as well because I cannot just keep doing my work and, and have you back for like two, three frames or five frames kind of a thing. That's how they communicate. So these are the way in, these hardware things communicate with each other. So, so, so even in CPU, the basics are uh, uh, like animations, like physics animations ai script this is what the cpu is usually calculating and uh, when when i'm talking about cpus i want to talk about graphic apis because when i told you the command buffer you remember the command buffer before i was talking like the, this translating language that that is called as is called graphics apis graphics apis are how you send the commands to the gpu through a driver there's there's this graphics api and a driver and that's how you talk to the gpu so, so you you see there are all these performance things that come up like Vulkan is performing like this, OpenGL is performing this. We'll look more of these into the into the upcoming class. But graphics APIs is a translation language is all I want to do. Remember here. And once once you enter the GPU, the keywords I would like you to remember are uh, it has draw calls from coming from the CPU and then it takes the data into vertex shader, and then rasterization happens and then fragment shader happens. These are all common terminologies that are used in computer graphics and gaming world. But then we'll get into uh, some some examples, like uh, a visual example. 
I'll not be going too much into detail about how the profiler works or anything here. It's uh, we're going to be looking at different profilers as well in the future. But in this case, this is a profiler that's being uh, used in Unity, and you, you see there they're showing how the frames are coming, how the CPU usage is varying, what is rendering, what is memory, like how much is the memory being utilized. Uh, it's it's basically like a game, a game within a game where CPU, GPU, memory are all working at at their performance max performance. And we have to make sure that they that they do a good job. All right. So within within the profiler, there is another uh, in inside Unity. For example, there is this thing called frame uh, debug. Okay. And frame debug is more like I told you, right? Like to make one frame, you have to draw several things layer by layer by layer. So so frame debug is basically like a GPU analyzer. It will tell you, hey, you know what? This is what the first thing that got drawn, and then the second thing, and the third thing. So you can have 100 draw calls or 500 draw calls for one frame, like 1,000 draw calls, 2,000 draw calls, which means how many times the GPU had to draw, 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 draw to get that whole frame to be completed. So, so that's, that, that's, that's exactly what you're seeing. When I was moving my cursor here, uh, when I'm moving it here, you're just seeing how 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 many draw calls are like coming in, all the all those things like one leaf, one mesh, and things like that. It's just drawing layer by layer by layer to complete the whole frame. All right, so these are the things you'll see in the profiler. When you see these things, you can be like, oh, okay, that's what it's doing. And now I can analyze all of this information. I can see if the CPU is the problem or the GPU is the problem. Hey, the CPU is running very slow. The GPU is running very fast. Why is the GPU running so fast? And uh, why is the CPU so slow? You'll start asking these questions. That's what you'll gain from profiling. And you'll see why, why are we getting stuck in this, uh, you know, this part of the game? Like, why is it? Why is the frame so slow here? So you can analyze all of this using a profiler, and the, uh, and 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 uh, we are in, we are living in a great age of uh, civilization. You know why? Because the tools are so good right now that we can actually debug. Earlier, it was very hard to debug all of this information, and you can you can have you can have so much information today in modern computing that you, that's why profilers are so useful. It, uh, like you, you can un under understand even like uh, you know there's an editor right unit editor or unreal editor uh, if you open it and if you profile it, it's going to give totally wrong information it's because uh, the editor itself is taking time on the computation so things like that matter a lot and the whole process will give you this idea that you need to test you need to analyze you need to optimize that's the whole repeating process that happens so one of the things that i would like to tell in this uh, in this concluding of pro profiling is Always plan your uh, optimizations. Uh, profiling is a time-consuming process. Do not do it without knowing what you want to do with it, because there are too many things that you can change. If you change one thing, that you'll create uh, another bottleneck somewhere else. Like if you try to make the GPU happy, sometimes the CPU will be unhappy. You know, things like that will be happening. So we'll be going into exact profilers about the NVIDIA Insight or. Uh, uh, or uh, uh, even uh, a render doc as examples. These are in, in industry standard profilers, and we'll be break, breaking down them into uh, case studies in our principles class. So final section is tips and tricks. We're going to go over some of the common tips and tricks that are used in the industry. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's like how you think kind of an approach. So when you think of tips and tricks in, in this, there are a lot of tips and tricks, but they will keep changing based upon the year in which you're working and which engine you're using and the hardware which you're working on. It's going to be changing. It's not a one size fits all formula at all. So, but the usual thing that I would like to mention is hardware measures, textures, UI, audio, physics, shaders, and lights. These are the main things which your brain has to pick up when you so when you try to solve a problem. So assume you have a game and now you now you want to solve. This is the order in which I would go. Measures. Uh, you can start asking questions like how do I optimize my mesh? Are you using LODs, which is level of detail where uh, I do not have to render uh, things that are very far away. I can render things that are very close, uh, like the, the things that the things that are close to the camera can have higher detail. So if you see here, there's a screenshot. That's that's a frame, right? It's a frame that's looking with all the details. But what you'll observe here is in the next thing that I show you, the objects that are closer have higher detail, and the objects in the back do not have so much detail. So the meshes are are very small in size. So what happens with this is 
you know, it's, you're saving memory now. That's that's all it, that's happening. It, it's either you're helping the memory or you're helping the CPU or you're helping the GPU. That's all you're have, making when you do any efficiency. So you're, here you're seeing uh, LOD1, LOD2 represented by these colors, green and blue. And then, you know, in the front, you're, you're having LOD0, which is the high level of detail. Basically, you're helping out on the memory and hence the GPU has less work to do. And you can ask if you're for those who are following Unreal Engine 5 is the new engine that's coming out next year. And they're saying, uh, you know, you can have any infinite amount of details in your meshes. So uh, it's basically, again, it's another optimization that the engine itself is doing. They are working on their own optimization techniques to make sure the LODs are automatically created and optimized when, when you're running in real time. So, so you will have to be aware of uh, all the all all the new engines that are coming out because like what I'm what I just told LOD might not even be relevant in Unreal Engine 5 sometimes you know that's that's the that's that's the way you have to think and culling is basically removing things that the camera is not seeing or sometimes even if the camera is seeing uh, if there's an object in front of another object you're not seeing that object so why do you process that right why should you give all the trouble for the CPU to send all the information to the GPU and calculate all those triangles, right? No need of doing that. That's what you're seeing. Like when a car is moving here, you're seeing uh, that mesh is not even being computed. It's not being even sent to the GPU. That's you're just basically saying memory, battery, and all this stuff. And the next thing is uh, another optimization technique commonly used in the industry is instancing, where but it, you'll try to help reduce a drop. I just told you, right? Every time you need to tell. One, one draw frame, you need to have so many draw calls. The goal is if you try to reduce your draw calls, you will try to make sure, hey, I do not want to use three draw calls to draw three cubes because the three cubes are just the same thing. I'm just going to combine all the three cubes and that's how I'm going to reduce my draw call. So instancing and, and, and doing those techniques will help your will help you get your geometry uh, rendered together. You can you can batch them together. That's what they call it as. But the thing is, you need to make sure they all have the same material. But you know, you cannot go too far with it. For example, you know, assume you have four objects like this uh, far away in a massive scene, and then you'll be smart enough and say, you know what, I'm going to just batch all of these and I'm going to put them for uh, uh, increasing my efficiency. What what what's going to happen is uh, you're actually going to, going to make a mistake here. Uh, this is what is going to happen. You were smart enough to uh, batch them all together and uh, put it into a single draw call. But then what happened is the other things that, that need to happen when a game or an experience has to run, right? In VR or AR or anything in general. I'm just talking in general right now. But you know, it's bad for uh, occlusion. Just now, with just now, I showed you an example of occlusion on culling and everything, right? Like it, it's so hard to uh, if you batch and and batch means you're just combining all these meshes. It's so hard to eliminate something out of computation if you eliminate some uh, if you attach them all together. So so it's bad for memory. Like you're you're again storing all of this uh, whenever you need to compute something. And if you need to collide, if you need to do any collision detection, you have to have a collider for all these objects. So it's it's bad for light mapping, which is another uh, way where you have to again put a common light map texture for the entire object. So there is always a trade-off in the technique that you have to choose. So you have to analyze before you do it. That's uh, that's one thing. And object pooling is, uh, you know, it's uh, this is a good example where you know you're you're using a bullet and uh, you're firing a lot of bullets. What happens is memory works in a way where it, it keeps allocating memory. Uh, whenever you create something, it creates memory, right? But also the other thing that happens is something called garbage collection, which is uh, memory has to be freed. You cannot go infinite memory, right? You have to have, let's assume you have one GB of memory to instantiate all these fire objects. You cannot keep doing that, right? For a game, there's a limited amount of memory. And especially if it's a mobile phone, you have a limited amount of RAM and computation available because other apps have to be running as well. So, so you, you, once you create memory, you have to destroy that memory. And, and I mean, you have to remove that memory as well, like after it's being used. So that's the destroy process. So object pooling means you don't do that often. You just keep a, it's a lump sum of memory available and just pick from it and then you use it and then you keep it back inside there. So that you don't have to do this thing called garbage collection where you free up the memory. Got it, right? So so these techniques, this is another technique. Another thing is cutouts, cutouts where, for example, you're doing a foliage and, and an environment, a massive environment. Uh, you can you can usually use a you know a, a square uh, or a, or a cube, uh, basically a rectangular kind of a mesh and then put a texture on top of it. But then what happens is you see the texture is only covering a bunch of these pixels. The rest are transparent pixels. 
So what happens is you're just wasting computation power telling the GPU to calculate for all those empty pixels. So instead, if you see here cutouts like the in the shape of the leaf itself, you're going to save mem you're going to save on calculations for the GPU, and the GPU is going to be happy about it. And the next one is after you see how to optimize measures, it's about hardware. So uh, the rule of thumb is do not profile it if it's not the hardware that where you want it to work. If you want it to work on a iPhone 6, and if you if you're doing the profiling on a powerful desktop PC, it doesn't serve the purpose. The same thing applies for Oculus Rift or anything. If you have to do any profiling, do it on the target hardware. Hardware, and you should be even smart even in that, which is you have to wait for a certain amount of time so that you can wait for like 10 minutes after it after the game starts, so it reaches the optimal temperatures and everything to to get the work done. And if you need to know about your hardware, you can go uh, check out uh, Steam's hardware and software uh, survey. It's it, it's going to have uh, you, you can you can check out on how uh, how many hardware pieces are there and how many uh, GPUs are in the market and things like that. And that way, you know, you can see what your consumers are using. So that that's another important analysis. And also, when it when it comes to hardware, like in the hardware you're using, display rate matters. So what does display rate means? Your monitor is refreshing at a certain speed, like it's very fastly refreshing. And when I, when I told your GPU is delivering the frame back to the monitor, sometimes your GPU is calculating too many frames and your display rate is slow. So you don't have to generate too many frames because your monitor only can display at 30, uh, let's say 30 hertz, let's say. But yeah, and your GPU is doing too much work. It's just over 18. So you can you can you can be smart about it and say, you know, I, I don't I don't have the necessity to calculate so many times because my display itself is just rendering at so many times. So I'm not going to worry about that. And the next topic is uh, that was hardware and next is textures. Uh, textures are like one of the biggest memory consuming things, right? Like uh, in like I told you, CPU, memory, GPU, textures are all the ones that uh, have to go from memory to GPU memory and then the GPU it, it has to get calculated and GPU will keep it in its own L1 cache, L2 cache and it, ha it has to be smart. So one of the techniques is MIP maps. So so if, if an object is far away or uh, again uh, it doesn't need all the massive resolution, why, why bring all of that memory into the GPU memory, right? Why not just take a small bit of it and use that into the memory and calculate only with that? So that's MIP maps, where basically in, in a texture, you're storing a bunch of smaller textures to make sure information travels faster for your GPU to get its job done. Also, uh, you can you can combine textures, you know, uh, a texture is made up of R, G, B, A, multiple channels. You can put one map in R, one map in G, B, like diffuse bump and things like that, and send one, one, one image instead of four images. Being smart, that's all. And and what is uh, another technique is uh, I, I we just talked about the transparent pixels right that's one case but the, uh, there's another thing that happens in computation this is a, these are visualizers what you're seeing is a visualizer running in Unreal Engine what exactly you're seeing is that the GPU is saying I'm I'm just computing unnecessary pixels here that's what it's white is like bad and blue is like the good one. Uh, it's good. It feel it's it's like the triangles are in a decent size. It's not like too small because if a triangle is too small, the the GPU is not even able to pick that up for the pixel calculation. You know, uh, so that's why it's saying I cannot calculate it. It's, I'm just wasting compute here. Uh, is what it's trying to say it out loud in that visualization. And light baking is another technique where if you want good uh, in the mod in in the current day, watching all these amazing uh, uh, photo real environment and everything, right? It's all due to a lot of, lot of it is due to light baking. Like you spend some time and you say, hey light, you know, spend 10 minutes or 20 minutes and calculate all the lighting calculations. I do not want it to real time. I just want it to be baked and, and do your job and I'm going to get it done is, is what you're saying for light baking. So light baking is where you create light maps and you store that information. Also you can do something called as light probes where you can save the light information in a particular space, in an empty space and later reuse it on an object. And then there is a thing called vertex paint where instead of, uh, you know, I could have used four textures here, but rather than that, I can paint directly on top of the vertices itself. Like vertex can save and store color within it. So so you are doing this uh, uh, painting painting thing where the whole mesh can be painted in uh, with vertex paint color. And then, then the next thing is in textures only, I wanted to mention UI is because uh, 
UI is sometimes we ignore it, like what is UI anyways, uh, it doesn't affect us, but UI is uh, another layer of rendering where it needs to calculate at the end of it, right? And uh, let's take a simple example. If your health or some other parameter in your game, if it's not updating, uh, why why calculate all of the data at uh, for every frame? So you can split up the UI elements into certain components in such a way that they call it canvases in Unity and the same logic applies in Unreal, where the components which are updating get their own canvases or, uh, to calculate. So that's about quick thing about UI. And post-process is something everyone use these days in games, but uh, you have to be smart about it. Like which post-processes are you support, uh, supporting and adding onto your hardware? Because some of them are way too, uh, you know, way too, uh, expensive is what I'll call it. They take a lot of time. And if you observe in your profiler, you're going to see that they are actually taking a lot of time. So you have to be careful about that. And physics is another component where uh, calculating physics can be expensive. It's a CPU side of things, but uh, you can you can create, you can be smart about how you create, create your colliders, the shape of them, uh, the shape of uh, these objects. Uh, if it's concave and all, it's, it's too many calculations. So, so you have to be careful about how you create your colliders. And memory optimizations, this is the final segment where you'll see uh, like memory mem memory is sometimes pre-allocated, right? Uh, like when you, whenever you start a game, you can you, you, you have to pre-allocate certain, certain set of memory to, to play the game. And that's, that's what the computing resources and operating system are going to be utilizing. But uh, the other thing that you have to remember about memory is, I told you as, to think of all of this as a game, right? CPU, memory, GPU, information has to travel. Try to keep the memory slow. Let it travel like really slow. It doesn't have to go too many times back and forth from here to there. So, uh, so that that brings to the next thing: optimization, which is loading. Uh, try to avoid loading while the game is playing. Like when I told you, uh, you have objects, you have textures, you have all these other elements that need to be going into this the the scene. You don't have to load all of them into uh, at the time of gameplay. You can load them beforehand, and uh, you can also you can also split your experience than uh, having a massive world where you have to load hundreds of miles of data. You can split it up into smaller sections and then load them piece by piece to make it an efficient process. So so we will be going into practical applications about all of them as well. Uh, we'll be very fast about it. Uh, so garbage collection is I, I just told you like it's basically picking up memory and trying to clean up the memory, saying I do not want. Uh, I do not want too much memory collecting. I, I wanted to pick up all the memory that has been assigned and clean it off, which is if it's not being used. So we can manually invoke that. See, like instead of uh, when you, when it's especially when a garbage collection happens, like that, think of a garbage truck coming up and taking all the waste things. It, it, it creates an interruption when the game plays. So that's why, you know, when you're playing and there's a lot of garbage collected, it'll, it'll just get stuck and it'll collect the garbage and then go. So instead of that, try to do it on a loading screen, things like that. Um, that's another optimization technique for memory. And uh, there are these things, there's an optim There's another technique called uh, tessellation where uh, it, it, you, you don't have to have a high resolution mesh. High resolution mesh means what is high resolution mesh? The CPU has to send all of this vertex data to the GPU. The GPU has to calculate for every vertex. Too much time, right? So the GPU itself has these optimization shaders called tessellation shaders, which can actually tessellate. Tessellation means splicing it up splicing it up into smaller pieces so that you can create better displacements, better effects with that. So that's what is called as tessellation technique. And that's a, that's another optimization trick where uh, you can save a lot of memory. And programming practices, we're not going to be doing any programming in this, but uh, in general, you have to be aware of what are data structures and what commands. Uh, like if you do not need a command to be running every frame, don't do it, like just run them. Uh, whenever they're needed, like uh, do not put into update loop if it's not needed to be there on an update loop. So, and also visual scripting has been a great thing uh, for all the artists out there, but visual scripting will be consuming some level of uh, processing because uh, the more some, if uh, you should think of it like if something is easier, then there is something else happening as a compensation for it. So if you're doing a lot of math in like, a, you know, blueprint or uh, Unity's uh, uh, node system, you better try to do it in uh, 
the native languages, programming languages. And also audio size has a important significance. If you're doing a lot of audio, again, audio is a memory thing. You can use things like uh, Warbis, which is which is a uh, compressed audio, but good quality, better than MP3. And you can think of lossless formats if you want, if you're doing it for PC and bigger hardware. Uh, if you're doing for VR and AR, and, uh, and if you need to be very short on space, use other techniques. And uh, uh, we're in, coming to the like end of this section where we, I just wanted to say internal optimization is something where the game engines will be doing certain optimizations for you. We don't have to be worrying about it. And uh, but you have to be aware of what is it doing, what is it not doing. Certain engines do it by themselves. Like for example, the batching thing I just spoke about, or optimizing calls by combining measures. That's that's a thing. That's something that Unity already does for you automatically. So you need to be aware if it's doing or not doing things like that. So that's what I meant by that. And from that you'll see, okay, the, uh, even the hardware will be doing certain times like thermal throttling. It will be decreasing and increasing the speeds. We're going to be looking deeper into those sections as well in the principles class. So finally, shaders. Uh, you see, this is a very, very simple example where uh, we are creating a game on the left side and then we realize, oh my God, I'm spending so much of my uh, GPU on the internal rendering of the car. And then you just change the material, upload it. You're just trying to be smart and say, I don't want those internal details. I'm just going to make it dark and I'm just going to skip all the information that's being uh, rendered inside. Uh, it's just being smart, but you know you have to be smart when you have to go for different hardware uh, uh, if you want to scale up your content to different hardware. And uh, look at this, the, the one on the left and the right, they're actually not using much competition at all. They're all being done inside something called shaders. I told you, right, GPU has vertex shaders and everything. So you're just uh, animating the vertices of an instrument. Actually, a uh, lot of the things on shaders will be coming up in one of the class on December 9th. So, Vertex shader is this one, and it, it, and uh, like we'll look at the monster up, up here. Like the monster here is not at all doing any uh, texture, or we're not sending any texture. We're just doing something called pixel shader. We're, we're taking the pixels and we're just engaging with some noise and some time, and it's creating that artifact. And it's very efficient computationally. We are not using textures. We're not transferring memory from. Uh, CPU or RAM or video memory, it's all happening in the GPU and it's giving you out your color buffer right away. So also I'd highly encourage uh, you to experiment with shaders rather than using uh, uh, like uh, brand, a lot of materials and a lot of complex materials, like writing your own shaders will, will be great. Uh, I would encourage you to look into shadertoy.com to great, get some great references. So this image that you're seeing, this uh, animation is is a is a is actually a shader and it was done by this little piece of code on the right hand side of it. It's, it's small, but so yeah. So on yeah, and uh, Freya will be talking a lot about shaders, I believe, on December 9th. So that will be great for you guys. But uh, but yeah, that's that's all I had to say. I hope you got to learn some brilliant keywords from this session uh, because keywords are what will enable you to do something called how to search and and. Uh, the world is all about how to search. If you know how to search, you can solve any problem in this world right now, uh, because all the information is out there in the internet, but it, you need to understand the overall concept about deep diving. And uh, each draw call is an opportunity for the artists and content creators to add more life to your scenes. So so yeah, every draw call counts, every pixel counts. So, so yeah, I hope this helped you all to get a brief glimpse of what we are going to be talking on the December 12th principles class. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vivek, for this uh, wonderful presentation. We listened really without even taking a breath because you you uh, go one by one for everything you can. So um, I hope everyone enjoyed that, which we see clearly from the uh, chat. So um, uh, one important that thing that I would like to share the technical details, everything is, of course, important. But for with this today's webinar and on 12th, we want to make sure that you first have a uh, understanding and mindset of optimization, right? So uh, this is important for us. We will go um, much more samples, use cases, pitfalls um, on the workshop to make sure that you understand how the things that you are seeing right now can actually be happening or uh, 
how you solve your pit, uh, pitfalls or your problems in a, in a real scenario, industry scenario or real project. So this is something that uh, our team and DVEC is preparing for 12. And I have, I mean, we have, we don't have so much time left, but I will definitely take the questions, a few questions from the, from the audience. And we have also alumni of our programs and uh, some, our students and uh, also uh, some of our trainers and mentors are here. Maybe they may want to jump in and ask question, but I will ask the most like um, interesting question for today because we just uh, have heard that Oculus decided to bring the um, all um, uh, side quest, let's say, uh, option into the directly to the headset. This means that we may see a lot more um, standalone experiences running on Quest 2 uh, at these games. And you can maybe even monetize your own game, even though it's not being um, approved by officially by Oculus Store. So this is quite exciting for us because we, we were dreaming about this day. So it is happening. So rendering optimization or art of rendering optimization will be um, more needed than before. So um, do you have any um, feedback on that? Because uh, on 12th, we have a special module focusing on um, optimization for standalone XR devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, the fact that a uh, lot, lot of this is a lot of new content is coming to XR is great. Uh, like VR is great, like this for quest side loading uh, for it. Uh, the, uh, the, the great thing though is uh, like there, there are like uh, you, we don't have to jump into the optimization right away, but uh, like you said, the content creation uh, can be focused on in the first phase. But uh, uh, from a rendering optimization point of view for these experiences uh, for VR, uh, they have some great tools which we will be covering in the optimization class as well, which is uh, uh, all the all the stage by stage on uh, how multi, uh, single pass stereo is working, how can you make it efficient. By for different VR devices, even if you have a one device with you and things like that. So yeah, uh, yeah, that's all I had to say about that. For perfect, now. perfect. So we have two questions as far as I see. One of them: How can we optimize your scene in Unreal while we are making hyper-realistic output? When we say hyper-realistic output, I assume that it is the the ones like this mega scans or quick scans. Yeah, it's uh, it's literally photorealistic, right? So so. Uh, First point number one, the, the all the lot of the hyperrealistic output that you're seeing in the movie industry right now, Mandalorian or anything, is is usually because they're using photogrammetry, a lot of good assets. So the quality of assets are really good. Mega scans or Quixel or anything, they're going giving you good assets to start off. So they are giving you good normal maps, bump maps, displacement maps, and hence asset quality makes a difference. And then the second thing that's happening is a lot of lot of time is spent on the baking. Uh, good lighting, good atmosphere. That's what is happening in creating the hyper-realistic output right now. And the RTX is useful uh, to a certain point for real time, but it is also helping on creating better light light maps and reflections and everything. What is the biggest optimization method that you can uh, tell us that is being used, especially for this kind of hyper-realistic scenes? I think that is the question that, uh, like, is there any Common like, method. One of the biggest optimization technique uh, that's being used is uh, definitely, uh, definitely like uh, LODs uh, are, are definitely being done very smart. Like then they're, they're not like uh, like all the meshes you see, it's not it's all using cutout cutout meshes, which is which is helping them as well to to do uh, to do photorealistic quality. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, another question: Can I share my render quality with? less gpu uh what uh, like meaning of sharing blender quality with uh, less gpu like if it means like how can it make better quality rendering with less gpu uh it it doesn't really uh make very helpful because like gpu has to process your pixels at the end of the day that's it has a fragment shader which is sh shading all your pixels so your gpu has to do a lot of work to if you need to get good quality but but you know you can be smart again about uh, the cpu based shading kind of a thing but that, that's a different topic altogether yeah so um there is one last question from idan which is 
I think for me very interesting. Where would you put optimization in the production pipeline, or should it only be used when encountering a bottleneck or wanting to insert any feature? I will also add one more additional add-on to this question. Is there anything like architecting your optimization plan before starting a project? Yes, and the architecture is uh, as simple as uh, it is in the question itself, which is uh, uh, do it regularly and do it often. That's the answer. Like optimization should be done regularly and often. It, it should not be done when you don't have anything. Like if you have an empty scene where you do not have enough features on it, then there's no point in doing it without testing it. But you can at least have an analysis. Like profiling always helps you regularly. Profiling helps you say, okay, this feature of having these many trees in this environment is consuming 16 milliseconds of my CPU time. So you can actually have this budget. It's just like how you're spending money, right? Like you can have your budget kind of a thing saying, oh, if I use this effect, it's going to be spending 10 milliseconds. So I better not use, use this effect right now. I'll let me use it for later time kind of a thing. It's like budgeting. Like it's like how you spend your money. You have to spend your render budget. So, so yeah. the answer is do it regularly, do it often and, and do not wait until the end. It's not going to work until the end. And then in the end, you'll be like, I wanted this feature. It's so great and it's not working. It's, it's failing. It's getting stuck. You, you will be entering that zone and we should not, I should not be doing that at the end of it. Can I come to the point that some of the optimization methods will not work anymore because it is irreversible that I have to restructure the uh, application or sometimes, game. Yeah. You will have to restructure either the game logic, the physics logic, or sometimes the whole shader logic, the look of the thing, because you will have to, there's so much hardware, there's mobile hardware, but we are hardware and some, the, a lot of the content these days are trying to port into multiple platforms. So what happens is nothing is compatible one-on-one -on -one sometimes. So, yeah. uh, but, but one, one interesting thing is we're going to be talking about uh, ARM's uh, performance analysis tool in our uh, profiling, uh, in our rendering class. And uh, it's going to give you like really good performance analysis of different hardware. Like uh, we'll, we'll be trying to see how we can profile different hardware uh, in, a, in a faster way. That's something that we're going to look into. Perfect. So we have one more question. Does prefabs help in the optimization? Yes. Yes, prefabs definitely uh, definitely help in optimization. Prefabs, right? Yeah, prefabs yeah. definitely help in optimization because you know it's it's more like uh, creating these instances. That's what we spoke about. Uh, and and you can instantiate these prefabs and and uh, especially the prefabs are all using the same material. They, they will be all be taking a single draw call and yeah, they will be efficient. And also you can use the concept of object pooling within the prefabs to, to reduce all the memory consumption as well. Great. Um, I'd like to use last minutes, uh, maybe taking a question, a few questions from our uh, panelists here, like um, maybe uh, our trainers or uh, alumni can can ask question in the meantime uh, i would like to also share with you that the video of this class will be shared um, probably next week um, but only if you use registered on the event right because we should have access to your email to send the link so uh, please don't forget to register if you haven't roger do you have any question um, maybe not a question but just like i Thank you very much for all the different topics. And I can fully uh, agree that all of those are highly important. I think even uh, in the VR or AR domain where every frame drop is painful and actually can lead to discomfort for the end user, um, those optimizations become very highly important, I think, for every application. And doing it at the end or porting a desktop VR experience to mobile is not something you can easily do. And you basically have to start again from scratch where you see how everything falls apart. So F definitely learn how to do it, even if you're not an artist. I think even if you're a developer, if you can tell your artist where the problem lies, because you can analyze you know, the actual performance is highly valuable. I think from an artist perspective to already design it correctly, but also from a program perspective that you can communicate with the artist is extremely important. I think is an essential tool uh, which you need for um, especially VR content development. And especially, I'm very looking forward for a lot of the details on actually the profiling and what we might have missed or don't know yet, because 
we have some experience in profiling and looking at things, but I think there's still a lot of depth to go further to squeeze out the last additional frame in any application. Yeah, that's right. There's always something that we, that can be improved in computation, right? It's it's just the ever changing industry. So much changes in three months. Hardware changes, software changes, and nothing is the same anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, even if you get better performance, right, with the XR2 chip and all of that, you still should optimize for the lower performances. You still have to be very careful because even XR2 chip, it has way more performance due to the heat production of it. It's still not as powerful as you might think when you just look at the spec sheet. And so it's it, it will not for the next five to 10 years, it will still be a very important aspect of any application when frame rates need to be at around 90 or maybe 120. And especially if it uh, affects user comfort. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few more questions. I don't know if we have time, but we will try to maybe answer a few. But in the meantime, Vivek, can you give us maybe a few minutes of uh, rough um, overall view? What should we expect from 12th of December uh, workshop? Like, what is the deep dive that we will see? Mm -hmm. for, with what with kind of uh, audience that we, we we can expect from there? So uh, I think we are we are uh, we are aiming any Unity Unreal developer who are already working on real time engines for different kinds of content from filmmaking to uh, games, mobile apps, VR, AR uh, is mm -hmm. already uh, like target group for this course, right? That's right. They're they're all the target group who can who can learn a lot of value in this uh, in this uh, session. Uh, the, the because the main thing that we're going to be talking is uh, a relationship with the hardware in which they're working on, and uh, they will they will have a better understanding of uh, okay this is how we need to start looking at the hardware and not just looking at the game engine software and know how to use the button logic in Unity or Unreal or other game engines, but understand what exactly they're doing inside the hardware so that we can be smart about any different effects that we need to perform or create. So, so we, we want to teach them the strategy and we will be talking about the strategy of how to, how to, how to go about, uh, uh, we'll definitely not be talking about, you know, press this button and then this button and this, then this button to achieve this. We'll never be talking about that in particular game engines. We'll be to talking about, uh, hey, you, you be a Unity user or an Unreal Engine user. This is how you have to think. You have to, if you have to solve a problem, is how we are going to do that. And we're going to be taking good examples from these engines itself, which are available for everyone to test out and try out to to analyze and understand this. And a lot of the profilers as well are open source, are available for free, and we're going to be showing them as well. Like, how do you analyze these things? Uh, how do you use uh, render doc and how do you understand uh, where you're where, where you're getting the bottleneck uh, kind of uh, approach? Because every problem is going to be unique, and uh, we'll be trying to cover as much details about hardware and software communication. Okay, there is a very interesting question from Taru, uh, one of our mentors. Um, from a designer perspective, it is good to know, even at least approximately, what is the different optimizations mean as they are part of the shared language when working as a team. So if I'm a designer working on a game or film or any VR AR content, so is there anything that I could take from this uh, mindset change? Yes, absolutely. Because that's the first stage where your, your thinking comes into, uh, it, it matters a lot, like the design and uh, Art, art is where the first step starts like uh, into, so, so usually what happens is uh, uh, like there are artists and they'll do what, whatever they want and then it will go to the rendering optimization people is what people think. But in, in reality, what happens is every artist is aware of the knowledge of, okay, this is the limitations I have and this is how I have to create things. I cannot go crazy with my textures and they have to be using these resolutions. So I have to be smart about the design I have to create for it. So that kind of thinking will start coming up rather than going all out on to creating anything that, that you feel like and then expecting the rendering engineer to figure out an answer for it. Because the rendering engineer can do only so much at the end of the day to make something efficient, like planning out on pixel shaders or uh, vertex shaders. But having a constant communication, even like having a little bit of awareness saying, okay, these are the limitations I'll be posed with. 
I will only be having to load about 10, 20 MB of memory for every frame. And I need to be smart about how, you, how I utilize this memory. Having such an understanding will really help you design things and make assets in a, in a better way in, from the beginning itself. But, but you know, it will be, it'll be a general introduction. We, and we're not going to go any technical. We're not going to do any programming in this section. We're only going to be talking about these are the basics. This is how information flows from point A to point B. And uh, let's see the journey of a triangle kind of the approach. OK, OK. Um, we have several questions. Some of them are related with the, a specific project or use case. I strongly recommend that you join to the Bring Your Own project, because uh, if you bring your own uh, pain point, it will be much easier for us to look at that. What are the problems uh, that you are facing with? Um, and then we can try to give uh, feedback. Of course, we cannot maybe debug or uh, make the profiling with you, but at least you will get a mindset understanding of uh, what can be the biggest um, uh, challenges that you may face and you are already facing and how you can solve it. So last of the last question, because we are already, um, we have to finish uh, pretty soon. Black Friday, I'm pretty sure that everyone wants to have a rendering farm or something today to buy. So <laughs> we have to uh, wrap up very quickly. So was the cutout technique to avoid transparency happening on a texture or on a mesh? How is the technique called exactly? So the, uh, like literally what's happening is uh, instead of uh, like when you when you create some uh, some plant or tree, usually the the easy way is you know create a, a big polygon and put a texture on top of it but uh, all that all the cutout technique is nothing but you know if you're using a software like speed tree or something you can create your own meshes inside there like you can create these cutout meshes inside there itself that's what i meant by cutout it's basically your mesh itself is cut in the shape of the texture itself so that you do not have transparent pixels available for extra processing for for your gpu that's all that's all it's called so you can just look up uh, uh, how to make efficient foliage uh, using cutout kind of a thing. Uh, by the way, uh, we have a Discord channel that uh, our team will, will share with you right now. If you can actually submit your questions to, to Discord channel, and we are also collecting the questions here, our, we can actually a little bit shape our uh, um, 12th of December program accordingly as well. Of course, we have still modules, but we are always open to the needs of the of the community. So happy to, to um, answer that or even create a small subsection inside our modules focusing on that. So um, yeah, um, our team already shared this XR Creators Expert Group. So you can uh, join there, uh, our Discord channel. So thank you, Vivek, for your time. Uh, it was very informative as far as we understand from the chat feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope that we will see you in the 12th of December. But before that, we have two very uh, important maybe uh, things to finish. One is the Black Friday. I hope that you will, um, you will enjoy the Black Friday deals with your GPU, etc. But we will help you if you have a... a a lower, um, maybe a little bit old uh, GPU. We will also uh, support you guys in terms of optimization. And so we also have our own Black Friday. So if you have uh, the chance to look at our website, you can also join one of the classes. Um, and of course, 9th of December, if you are a little bit of interested, shaders, 3D interactions, mathematics, uh, for games and VR, uh, I strongly suggest that you you join us again another open lecture with Freya. Um, she is one of the most well-known uh, Unity plugin creators and shader creators. Um, so we are happy to to host her here in the open lecture. So thank you again, Vivek, Roger, and everyone joining us today. And I wish you a, a very nice weekend and hoping to see you in the next open lecture. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.